My name and welcome to the Magical Circle School's Magical Moments podcast. As you can all tell from that little bit of introduction, we have changed our name. In the last two months, there has been a lot of changes happening in the school, which we're all excited about. This podcast has a little information about the changes that have happened in the school, so keep listening and you will find out about some of the changes. As for with the podcast itself, there have been a few little changes that I thought I would mention before we get on into the contents. As you all have probably noticed, we have a new home. Although we are still being uploaded to YouTube, the school has a new channel. Unfortunately, due to this move, we have lost the previous podcasts, but we will be working hard to get any lost information back out to you all. With the new location and name, we would also like to invite you all to come up with an image for the podcast that we will use as a thumbnail on the YouTube channel, but also use in adverts for the podcast. If you're interested in knowing more, please feel free to contact me either in the school through the internal messaging system or emailing me directly at nk.steven at gmail.com. Now, on to the contents of this month's podcast. In this month's podcast, we have The Crafting Club with Wendy, The Kitchen Witch Club with Amber, The Writers Under the Moon with Freya, and The Newsletter with Amber and Wendy. We have The Roundtable Discussion with Savannah, we have Reviews from the Bookshelves with Freya, we have The Wheel of the Year with Jackie, The Deity Segment with Stephen, The Creature Feature with Freya, we have The Tarot Table with Jenny, and The Room Bag with Freya. Welcome to April's Magical Moment with the Crafting Club, presented by Wendy. That's me. The last few weeks were filled with changes, exciting, frightening, amazing and wonderful changes. And we know that many students used this time as a sort of spring break, which is fabulous. But the Crafting Club still had an amazing month, designed by Bella Raven, and we were crafting with kids throughout March. My nephew loved the tulips especially. If you haven't already, check out her Make Something Monday postings. They are amazing. Since Bella joined our mod team, she has worked tirelessly to support not only me, but also the other members of the crafting club. A huge thank you for that, Bella. And from next month on, she will join me in this podcast segment and eventually take it over completely. So exciting changes, not only at school, but in our clubs as well. Join us for the ride, you won't be disappointed. Now, next month, we will be crafting a dream catcher together. Amazing, right? We will share many tutorials. Everyone who wants to join in picks their favorite one. And then on Mondays, we will get together and show our progress, discuss issues and show off our final pieces. At the end of the month, we will also talk about our Beltane crafts. Are you setting your table? Do you have a seasonal altar? I am excited to hear about your arts and crafts for the Sabbath. Now that the school has moved and reopened, The Crafting Club wants to refocus its attention on the fundraiser project as well. If you would like to join us in designing an oracle deck, greeting cards, a coloring book or have different ideas, then please contact Bella or me and let us know. The profit from selling these will go directly to the school. So that is a way you can help out with the school if you like to. Some of the upcoming themes for this year will include crafting for outdoors, crafting for indoors and artist trading cards. I'm so excited for all the changes and new adventures. If you would like to join the crafting club, contact Bella or me, Wendy, with your student launch ID. Merry part! I'm Amber McKenzie for the Kitchen Witchery Club segment. With all the recent changes to the school and our host sites, we wanted to take this opportunity to share our world within the Kitchen Witchery Club. Now, this club is probably one of the easiest in the school to make yourself a part of, since you probably cook something every day. 
If this describes you, then yes, you would be a fabulous addition to our club. Within the club, you will see members of all skill levels. We have people that are so adept that they seem to be able to make anything they do come alive with magical intent. Now, for the rest of us, we do our best to weave a little magic into our recipes as we need to work a spell. There's a little bit of planning, researching, just as you would do with any other spell that you would do. Lining up correspondences to fit the energy you need while staying true to the taste of a recipe is a balancing act. But it is so much easier than you think it is. This year, we are returning to the herbal worksheets and developing our own knowledge of some basic kitchen herbs and spices. For the most part, our club focuses on edibles and how to incorporate herbs and spices into the food and drink that we prepare. We concentrate on those since they're so easy to use and that helps us create energy that works with our intentions. Each of the theme herb or spice of the month has been chosen to enhance the energy of that month and help us make the connections to each recipe that we want to create. In Kitchen Witchery, the magic happens when you use a little focused energy to weave your spells, hopes, and dreams into the foods that we make. Now this is not limited to cooking. Teas, tinctures, even aromatherapy can come to play. Just think of a smell that can magically transport you to a special time and place. See, atmosphere can be just as important as the foods and drink that is served. Setting a table or creating a buffet landscape can be magical. Choosing linens of a certain color or centerpieces for a table can help enhance that overall feeling you're going for. These little tips and tricks are things that we'd love to sink our teeth into. The more you know, the more you have to pull from when you are in your own kitchen. Now we discuss our recipes, research, our experiences, things that we want to try practically on a daily basis. All of these are important items to consider as we build our own cookbook of shadows. When we focus on the ingredients and prepare them with intent, baking, cooking, or assembling the meal becomes a ritual. Each step sets the stage and manifests the magic. This is the goal of the Kitchen Witch. So come chat with us in the club meeting hall. We have bi-weekly meetings and club chats. The chats are scheduled for April 8th and the 22nd from 10 to 11 a.m. This is Eastern Time, also the same time as the server. We are ready to discuss magical correspondences, share recipes, and encourage experimentation. So join the fun by joining the Kitchen Witchery Club. Simply email your student lounge ID to kwclub at hotmail.com and we'll get you added. We hope that through your journey with us, you can find a comfort level, not only making your foods healthier, but also filled with the magic of your hearth and home. Struggling with writer's block? Not sure what to write next? Want published in the school's newsletter but just not sure what to write? Or are you just looking to chat with other writers in the school and gain valuable contacts and information for your future in writing? Maybe you should join Writers Under the Moon here at the Magical Circle School. We're a small but quickly growing group of writers supporting one another in our journey to write. Your work, if you choose to submit it, could be featured in the newsletter and podcast right here in the advertisement for the group. The Remind Service has all sorts of character and plot inspirations, along with inspirational quotes from some of the greatest writers in history. We're currently building a Pinterest page for you to post all your ideas and resources in. There's also a Facebook group, if that's more your thing, which will post regular reminders of any competitions, events and publications of our members. We'll also be setting up a chat night so you can meet up in real time to swap ideas, help plan the future of the club and chat to people with similar interests. To join the group, please email me at jlt.freya at gmail.com. That's jlt.freyja at gmail.com. We can't wait to see you in there. Headmistress Savannah Moon with the Savannah's Roundtable Discussions, previously known as the podcast Ask a Witch segment. 
This month, I have decided that it would be best to discuss the recent changes at the school. First, however, on behalf of myself, Headmistress Danny, Headmistress Laura, and Headmistress Jenny, as well as Teacher Dana, we thank you for your support and assistance over the past several weeks. We appreciate that so many of you have remained with the school during these changes. The next big thing I need to address is Mrs. Criswell's decision to step away from the school. As you can imagine, running the school can be stressful. Mrs. Criswell was doing all of the administration work, teaching all three segments of the entrance exam, which is now the orientation series, as well as other classes, organizing the school's rituals, and the Spell of the Month Club, and so, so much more, all by herself. Imagine trying to do all of this and receiving many different negative, hurtful, and ridicule ridiculing emails. This is exactly what Mrs. Criswell was dealing with, almost on a daily basis. Can you imagine how badly that must have hurt? Since we know that like energy attracts like energy, we can only imagine how Mrs. Criswell felt when she worked so hard to keep the school going as well as safe, only to find all of that negativity in her inbox. She felt as if she wasn't good enough to teach any longer and turned away from something that was so very important to her. What can we learn from all of this? Even if you find it hard to do so, respect the people who try so hard to do something positive for people they don't even know. While we can't see each other face to face, we are all as human as the next person. I do sincerely hope that you will wish her the best and ask for only positivity to follow her from here on out. Please join me in a moment of silent prayer for positivity, healing, and love. So mote it be. Now that I have covered the recent sadness, let's take a moment to focus on something more positive. As you have seen, two new degree programs have been added to the school. I will be introducing the Fireside Path degree program about mid-2018. Laura is also currently working on her degree program, the Natural Witchcraft Path degree program. Keep an eye out for more information. There are also several new classes in the works, so keep an eye out for them as well. These classes will start appearing as we get the new site up we have worked so hard on over the past few weeks. We are very excited to share these upgrades with you and extremely grateful for the patience you have shown us in return. We hope to have everyone back in and going on assignments by Monday, March 26, 2018. Aside from any unforeseen circumstances, we are on our way. In closing, I would like to remind everyone that on the other side of the computer, there are five women that have busy lives who appreciate the fact that you allow us to guide you on your path. And we do find what we do at TMC very important. Even if it's hard, please have patience with us as you wait for assignments to be graded and as you wait to be enrolled in a class. We appreciate each and every one of you. This has been Savannah Moon for Savannah's Roundtable Discussions po podcast segment. Brightest of blessing and merry part.
Merry Meet and welcome to the reviews from the book- bookshelves in this, your April podcast. My name is Freya Mahogany and today we're going to be discussing a piece of fictional work. This was originally featured in an old podcast, but I decided to reuse it this month because I just enjoyed it so much the first time around and since the move, you don't really have access to it, so I figured you might like having it here too. This time a play rather than a piece of prose, William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. This play is, other than a small few, the best known of Shakespeare's works, works, and in my opinion, a true example of fictional mastery. Quickly, we meet our four lovers, Lysander, Hermia, Helena, and Demetrius. Hermia, the daughter of a duke, is told she will marry Demetrius, be relegated to a nunnery, or be given a death sentence. And upon hearing this, she runs away with Lysander, the object of her affection. At this time, we also learn that Demetrius is infatuated with Hermia, and is uninterested in Helena, who just so happens to love him. Ah, Shakespeare, you old romantic. So we leave the lovers and their quandary to meet the king and queen of the fairies, Titania and Oberon. These two eternal lovers are quarrelling, for Titania has adopted a boy whom she's taken a fancy for. Enter stage right the truthful Puck, who, upon the wishes of his master Oberon, places magic drops upon the eyes of dear Titania, so that she will fall hopelessly in love with the first person she sees. This is Oberon's plan, that he should be the first. Oberon also sees the plight of our four young lovers, and, afraid to see love unrequited, decides to have Puck step in to aid this foursome. He instructs Puck to place the same magic drops upon the eyes of Demetrius in the hope he will awake, see Helena, and return her otherwise broken love. All does not go go to plan, however. Does it ever when Shakespeare is involved? And Puck mistakes Lysander for his target, and so Lysander's eyes are magicked, and he awakens to see Helena, promptly dumps Hermia, and starts lusting over the other. Among this chaos, we also see an acting troupe headed by our other protagonist, Bottom, who are rehearsing to produce Pyramus and Thisbe to be played for the Duke, Hermia's father. With Puck being a bit of a mischief maker, he decides to play a prank on the unsuspecting bottom and charms his head to be that of a donkey. As it just so happens, Titania awakes nearby the troop and the first person she lays her eyes upon is the donkey bottom, and so she is enamoured with him. She keeps him and bestows upon him all the riches of her kingdom, much to the amusement of Oberon. Then Oberon finds out that Puck screwed up, so he magics the eyes of Demetrius himself. Helena is now wooed by both men and unfortunately feels that they're mocking her. Eventually, Oberon decides that it all must stop, so he puts the four mortal lovers to sleep, feeds Lysander the antidote for the eye drops so that he'll love Hermia again. Then he gives the antidote to Titania in order to reconcile with her. She falls instantly back in love with her king of the fairies. The four mortals awaken in the woods and return to Athens to be together, Hermia with Lysander and Helena with Demetrius. Oberon returns bottom to his acting troupe and they perform Pyramus and Thisbe at the wedding feast, now for all three couples. The fairies then come to give their blessings, and the mischievous Puck comes to beg forgiveness for any offence, to assure the audience that, if they're negatively affected by the play, to consider it nothing but a dream, and to wish good night unto everyone. So let's break down this also confusing play that plagued my first year of high school, shall we? First, of course, the theme of love, well, between everyone, honestly, which deeply permeates the play. The love felt between new lovers, long married people, the love of friendship, and the familial love of parents to their children, as Puck is often treated by Oberon. Next, there is the humour, given with the whole bottom is a donkey and the fairy loves him situation, which, especially in Shakespeare's day, would have been hilarious, let me assure you. There is also the theme of not really getting what you want, and if you do, it being a fake occurrence, and this is the theme that sticks with me most, even from a high school reading of the play, and it's something that I think we can take enlightenment from in our magical workings. Let's take the case of poor, poor Helena and her feelings for Demetrius. With Oberon's help, she finds that her her advances are reciprocated and is happy for it. She marries Demetrius, and as far as we know, she lives happily ever after with him. But let's look a little deeper here. The only reason Demetrius ever even looks at Helena over his love for Hermia is because of the fairy's magic eye drops. Until then, he isn't bothered with her even slightly, and would have happily married Hermia at the demands of her father. Does he love Helena? Really? I think the obvious answer here is no, and because of that, the relationship is based on a foundation of lies and trickery. This is, I think we can all agree, no way to start a relationship, and certainly doesn't promise any happily ever after. So was Oberon right to step in? Was Helena ever going to feel the real love of her affections? What would have happened if Demetrius ever snapped out of the spell he was under? These are all moral questions that I'm going to leave with you in this segment. It's, if nothing else, something to think upon when we're discussing the morality of things like hexes, love spells, and that sort of thing. 
For those truly interested, by the way, I played Helena in high school. My name is Frey Mahogany. This was a review from the bookshelves on a Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare, Merry Part. <laughs>Jackie and welcome to my segment the wheel of the year. This time we'll be talking about Beltane. Beltane is celebrated on May 1st. It may also be celebrated from sundown on the night before to sundown on May 1st or may be calculated out using astrological markers depending on your tradition. Another thing to remember that is if the actual date of the holiday doesn't work for you, celebrate it sometime around the date. We are honoring the turning of the wheel in natural rhythms. It won't hurt anything to celebrate it when you can. Watch the calendar to see when the new school site is ready for us to hold a Beltane ritual. Beltane is an old holiday known by many names. May Day, Set Samhain, which means the opposite of Samhain, or Purgis Night, which is Beltane Eve, and also just by what it is, the beginning of summer. Beltane has old roots, including the Celtic Fire Festival honoring the Celtic God of Light Bell, and in the Roman festival of Floralia, or Feast of Flowers. One thing the old and new festivals have in common is the celebration of fertility of the earth. Be sure if you are taking your family out to celebrate Beltane that you find a kid-friendly celebration. Beltane and Samhain are opposite each other on the wheel of the year. As such, during both times of the year, where the veil between our world and the other worlds are thought to be the thinnest. Samhain is a time to commune with your beloved dead, and Beltane is a time to think about the fairies. That being said, fairies are known to be tricky tricksters, so don't offer up anything that you aren't willing to lose, and don't think that you will outsmart them. Unless you've done some research, you might avoid entering into any transactions with the fairies at all. However, Beltane is a lovely time to leave offerings and gifts for the fairies. If you wish, a nice way to honor them is to make your garden or yard fairy friendly. Make a secret little home or a place to relax with little chairs, tinkling little bells hung around in some water. Some people like to create magical circles for fairies to enjoy themselves. There are certain flowers that are thought to be particularly attractive to fairies, such as tulips, mints, rosemary, mugwort, and any other flower that attract butterflies are thought to be beloved by the fairy. Some of the traditional ways to celebrate Beltane include bonfires, feasting, dancing, music, flower-filled celebrations, and dancing the maypole. Some ways to celebrate as a solitary could be to bathe in the morning dew, walking around your property, and mending fences. My children's school has a Mayfair, which is one of my favorite school events. The entire playground is draped in pretty fabrics and garlands of flowers. It begins with a drum-led procession through the school to bring all the children out of their classes to join in the festivities. The eighth graders sit in a circle, each holding a, a bit of corn in their hands, and a chicken is placed in the middle. This chicken chooses the May Queen and May King by choosing to snack on a particular child's offerings. They then preside over the festivities. There's usually a battle between the Green Man and King Winter, which King Winter always loses. There are games, crafts, and music, and the highlight is a beautiful maypole where the children all dressed in white dance the maypole. It is a beautiful way to say hello to summer, and is bittersweet as it is the last festival our 8th graders participate in before heading off to high school. Some traditional correspondences for Beltane would include the plants of ivy, daisies, honeysuckle, lilac, mint, roses, and pretty much any flowers that are native to your area. The symbols of bonfires, bells, candles, may baskets, may king and queen, and the maypole. The colors of green, red, pink, white, lavender, yellow. But use what feels right to you and what is actually corresponding with what is going around you in nature. 
Some of my favorite entries in the resource library include a playlist by Laura and Egg Charm by Savannah. Watch for my newly added entries for floral crowns, May baskets, and floral chains, and others. Also, Pinterest is full of great ideas for activities, decorations, and for recipes to complete your Beltane celebration. This has been Jackie with the Wheel of the Year Beltane, Mary Park. My name is Stephen and welcome to your deity segment. This month I thought we would cover four different nature deities briefly since we have missed so many podcasts recently. So in this, this month we will be covering a little about Freyr, Hecate, Pan and Ningal. So let's get into it and start with Freyr. Freyr, sometimes referred to as Frey or Ingvi, is a god that originates from the Norse pantheon. More specifically, he hails from the Vanir tribe of deities and became an honorary member of the Aesir tribe. His father is Njord and his mother is Njord's sister, thought to be Nerthus or Skadi, and Freyr's sister is Freya. Freyr was highly worshipped in Sweden, but he was also worshipped in Norway and Iceland. Freyr married the giantess Gerdr, who came from the Jotunheim. Freyr lives in Alfsheim, which is the homeland of the elves. The elves were thought to have created the ship that Freyr owns, Skidbaldr. The ship is thought to be so big that all of the gods in their full sets of armour are able to fit aboard the ship easily. It is also thought to be the fastest ship and said to always have winds in its sails. Skidbaldr is also thought to be able to be folded and kept in a pouch. It is also believed that while on land Freyr travels in a chariot pulled by Gullin Bursti, the boar. Freyr has connections with nature through some of the things he is considered a god of. For example, his association with fertility, both in people and animals and in crops. He is also associated with wealth, which ref references harvests. He is also thought to have been the god of the sun and rain, which without these things plant life would not be able to grow, and therefore there would be no animals and humans due to lack of food. Now moving on to Pan. Pan is depicted as having the legs and horns of a goat and torso, arms and face of a man similar to a fawn and comes from Greek mythology. The Roman counterpart of Pan is Faunus. Although it is unclear who his parents are, there are a few people that are considered as both his mother and his father. It is thought that his mother could have been the nymph named Dryope, Penelope or Aphrodite and his father could have been Zeus, Dionysus, Hermes or Apollo, although it is commonly thought that Hermes is Pan's father. Pan was originally an Arcadian deity. There is no specific place that was built as a place of worship for Pan. Instead, Pan is worshipped in nature, such as in caves. Pan was known for chasing nymphs in order to seduce them, but was never successful due to his appearance, and this is where the term panic is thought to have come from, as well as the origins of panic being associated with the nymphs running from Pan, it is also thought to have come from how terrifying his voice became when he was angry. In Arcadia, Pan was considered a pastoral god and later was thought to dwell in the mountains and forests within Greece. He is thought to be the patron of shepherds. He is also thought to be the god who watches over the, the hunting and breeding of animals. Let us now cover Hecate. 
Hecate comes from ancient Greek mythology. She is the goddess that precedes the god and goddess of Olympia, Olympus and was worshipped Thrace. It is thought that she is the daughter of two titans, Asteria and Perseus. Although she is the thought she is thought to have been the daughter of two titans, she is seen as an ally to the gods and goddesses of Olympus, and was considered to have been the only titan to help Zeus and the younger gods in the battle against the titans. As a result of this, unlike the other titans, she was not banished to the underworld. Hecate was also part of the mythology surrounding the birth of Zeus, as one of the midwives that hid Zeus as Gaia gave Cronus a rock to consume instead. The earliest depiction of Hecate is made out of terracotta, where she is sitting upon a throne. This depiction dates back to the 6th century and was found in Athens. After the defeat of the Titans, Zeus is thought to have gifted Hecate a share of the earth and sea. In her early worship, she was known as the goddess of wild places, childbirth and crossroads. Now, finally, let us touch on Ningal. Ningal, also known as Great Lady or Queen and the goddess of reeds, originates from in Sumerian mythology. She is the daughter of Enki and Ninik. Kuga. Ningal was the lover of Nana, the Sumerian moon god, and gave birth to Utu, the Sumerian sun god, and Inanna, the Sumerian goddess of love, knowledge and war amongst others. In some texts there is also a reference to her being the mother of Ishku. It is thought that Ningal was the one out of the coupling of Nana and Ningal who fell in love, although it was thought that Nana did feel the same way. The deities would meet at night in the reeds to be able to have hidden moments of intimacy. Ningal is thought to have been originally worshipped by cow herders in the marshlands of southern Mesopotamia. Ningal was later introduced to the people of Syria, which was the ancient centre of moon worship and in Ugarit she is known by the name Nikal. Her connections to nature would come from her connections to the reeds and marshlands as well as as her asking Nana to make the land the lands, marshes and animals fruitful before she would be willing to live with him. This has been your deity segment for this month. My name is Stephen. Merry part. Hey there, my name is Frey Mahogany and this is your first creature feature in the school's new home here on YouTube. Let's talk about dragons. Dragons are found within most mythologies in the world. They have unique correspondences, useful energies that can be evoked by those helping to incorporate dragon magic into their path. So this month, I've chosen a Japanese dragon to cover. He has eight heads, eight tails, and reaches across eight hills and eight valleys. He was, in Japanese mythology, chopped into pieces by Suzanu, also known as Suzanwo. His name is Yamata no Orichi, also known as Orichi, and he's a large dragon whose known history dates back to around 6, 680 Common Era, where it's thought the name is derived from the old Japanese word Woroti, and it is believed to have originally meant big snake, large serpent. The legends of this eight-headed dragon are recorded in both the Kojiki and the Ninghongi, where in both Yamata no Orichi comes up against the cunning and strength of the storm god Suzanu. The story goes like this. Having been expelled from the god's place, Takamagahara Suzanu travelled to the land of Izumo, near the high river, where, to his surprise, he saw chopsticks floating downstream. Thinking that this must be a sign that people lived nearby, the storm god followed the river upstream, where he came across a couple sobbing with their daughter, Kusinada, and so Suzanu asked the family, 
why do you cry and they told him of the awful eight-headed yamato no orichi and they spoke of his huge size as large as eight mountains and eight valleys covered in trees and moss they spoke about a forest upon his back and his belly sore and bloody they told him of the creature's red eyes and his green-tinged skin and then they told susanu of their other seven daughters kusanada being the youngest who had all been eaten by the serpent one per year until only kusanada himi remained they sobbed and wept to the storm god lamenting that as their tale was told once they'd finished the horrific story susanu offered to help the couple in return for their daughter's hand in marriage if they agreed to allow him to marry kusanada he would go and kill the great beast they happily agreed and so susanu hatched a plan first with his godly powers susanu transformed his bride-to-be into a comb and hid her in his hair then when he was sure she was safe he took the couple he told the couple to brew eight times refined sake and build an eight-gated fence around it to each gate they were to tie a platform so there would be eight in total and leave a vat of the eight times refined sake upon each they were then to hide somewhere susanu told them so that they would be safe so the sake and fences were all set up, the couple were hiding, and Susanu's bride was safe within his hair. The great gra- dragon Arici came and drank deeply from the sake vats. So drunk he became that he passed quickly into a deep slumber. As he came to Yamato no Arici, Susanu cut him into pieces, and quickly the high river ran red with the blood of the beast. As he cut the dragon's tail, Susanu noticed a blade held within, a great sword which the hero offered his sister, Amaratsu, who was the sun deity. The sword was called Kusanagi no Tsurugi. The great sword Kusanagi, which is known as one of the three great imperial treasures of Japan. The other two are the mirror, Yata no Kagami, and the jewel, Yasakani no Magatama. These are thought to be representations of the three primary virtues of a person, valour being the great sword Kusanagi, wisdom being the mirror, and benevolence being the jewel. The stories behind the other two items are actually really interesting, and I'd suggest going looking them up. Super interesting stuff. Anyway, back to our hero and his slain enemy. When Kushinari Himi was safe, Susanna looked for a place they could be together and live happily, eventually deciding on the land of Izumo, and this is where he built his palace. When he finished, a great cloud appeared in the sky, and to it, Susanna recited a poem that I'm not going to recite here because I'd butcher it, but it will be on the screen for you to look at. The poem he recited is believed to be the beginnings of what we now know as Japanese poetry, such as haiku and waka. So let's discuss many-headed beings first. Yes, there's Yamata no Arichi, and we all know about Cerberus, the three-headed dog of Greco-Roman mythos. We might even have heard of the Lycernian Hydra, more commonly just the Hydra, slain by Hercules. But in mythology, there are actually lots of different encounters with multi-headed beings and creatures, usually fearsome, with a very bloody story to go alongside. Ben Saiten, also of Japanese mythos, is the name of Saraswati, who killed a five-headed dragon at Inoshima, and a nine-headed dragon, Kuzuria, derived from the snake kings Vasuki and Shesha, is wrapped, ra- wrapped at Tokakushi Shrine in Nagano Prefecture. There are also creatures like the Chimera, which has the heads of many different creatures, and is found in Greek mythology. Maybe we'll do an episode on that one sometime soon. And pardon my pronunciation here, it's going to be bad. Uch Chai Shravas, I think, who is the seven-headed flying horse in Hindu mythology. There are examples of many-headed creatures in almost every mythos around the world, most of whom can be evoked for their powers of sight, their ferocity, and their ability to take down even the most frightening of foes. Yamata no Arichi is no exception. He's furious, huge, strong. He, his uses within magical practices are numerous. One could ask for his help in taking down a large problem. He could be evoked for any of the correspondences one has for the number eight also. So, things like fear, respect, the eight sabbats, balance, openness, and communing with the gods. He's also very much so an earthen dragon with the moss and trees on his back, and so could be called upon for grounding in that aspect, or as a way to commune with part of Mother Nature. The colour of the dragon must also be examined for its correspondences. Green is the colour of earth, nature, gardening, healing, financial success, luck and good fortune. At least it is to me. What about you? What links and correspondences do you have for the element of earth, the number eight, and the colour green? If you go through these, you'll never be far wrong. 
Other things to associate with this great dragon include the sword which grew in his tail, which stands for valour, so absolutely someone to look to for courage, for a weapon, figuratively of course, when you're in need. As we can tell from this segment, Yamato no Orichi is a dragon who, when evoked, is useful, but he's also someone to be wary of, and be respectful of. So in terms of offerings and leavings for him, you could use anything you'd usually use for earthen associations, or his favourite drink, sake. You could also use any traditional Japanese cuisine, miso soup, rice dishes, sushi, sh sashimi, tempura, or yakitori. Just remember to leave enough of each for each of the eight heads that were promoting balance. The other thing I associate highly with dragons of all sorts is any red, well-done meat which is sear or seared or flame-grilled, because that tends to make me feel like I'm some sort of medieval knight fr back from a hard day saving the people. But I'm a big nerd, so go with what feels right for you. Another way to or honour Yamata no Orichi is to include him on the altar. You could absolutely use an image of him, or a green earthy dragon with many heads. You could use green eight pebbles eight green pebbles, eight leaves, or multiples of eight of natural materials. You could construct a poppet-like creature from eight green ribbons and weave the ends together to represent the body of the dragon, using green thread and eight stitches to hold the ends together, and keep this on your altar for when you need to evoke the strength or other correspondences of Orichi. You could also fashion an eight-headed dragon from clay and paint it green, or if you're way better at crafts than I'll ever be, even give him a sword in his tail. The point is here there are plenty of ways to evoke him into your life, and plenty of ways to honour and thank him for his influences. So get creative. There's no right or wrong way to thank a creature. There's no right or wrong way to honour them. Just keep in mind that if they're being present and helping in your life, be sure to go out of your way to do something in order to say thank you. So that's Yamata no Orichi. Let me know in the comments if there's a creature you'd like to see covered in a future month's podcast. And be sure to like the video and subscribe to our brand new YouTube home. This was your creature feature. My name is Freya Mahogany. Thank you for listening. Hello everybody, this is Jenny with the Tarot Table. Thank you all for the warm wishes and the welcome back from when I was in the hospital for the month and the half I was gone. The warm wishes and the prayers were so appreciated. So the reading I'll be doing today comes from Jody, and she asks, I fell in love with my childhood friend back in 2012. We decided to move my twin daughters and us in together, following our wedding in 2014. When we moved, we needed to find a house quickly as I gave up my home for someone in need. We settled on a tiny house in a small town. The tiny house isn't the issue, it's the small town. I grew up in the country all my life, so that is my comfort zone. We both were country kids and want to get back out there to start our own homestead, not to mention the townsfolk have not been too friendly. Finances have not been our, in our favor as I was sick for several years, and we have lots of catching up to do. My question, will we move to our own homestead before 2020? I would love to have a reading using the Celtic deck. Blessings. Okay, first off, I've drawn the first card, and it's the Three of Wands, which shows a man standing on a rock overlooking a water as it stretches seemingly forever with no land in sight. He holds a staff in his hand, and two more staffs stand behind him, securely dug into the ground. Next is the Seven of Wands, which shows another man on a hillside battling it out with six others below him. He has the upper hand because of the higher ground, but he's only one person against six. Finally is Goinu, who stands working at his iron, making a sword. He is focused on what he's doing while he works his trade, hammer in hand, the other holding the glowing red metal s still with the pair of tongs. So tying this together, I think you are going to get your wish of moving, but it will be, will it be in 2020? I think it's going to take a good bit longer than that, and with a lot of work and discussion, even debating and fighting to achieve your goal. I do you wish you well.
Hey, Freya Mahogany here, and this is your rune bag for this month. Today I'll be doing my best to answer a couple of questions, and I've recently started doing a new runes class at the Magical Circle School, so these readings are all going to be done in new ways, which I'm super excited for. The first comes to us from Stephanie W, who says, Hi Freya, I have a reading I would like to have done if possible. I'd love a rune bag reading, please. What roadblocks should I be aware of, if any, to do with my recent career change? Thank you, Stephanie. Hi Stephanie, I drew a single Give Me a Sign rune for you. The rune I drew was Fehu, which in this reading presents the meaning of fortune. Good fortune usually. It has to be made clear though that good fortune doesn't always mean wealth, so be careful that your financial situation doesn't become something you struggle with. But in general, this change in circumstances is going to be something which will bring you things others might envy. Again, be mindful that this envy doesn't turn into spite. You don't want to gloat about what you've come across. Instead, try your best to maintain humility in your success. The second question is from Carolyn B, who says, Hi Freya, I would love to submit a question for the rune bag reading. My husband and I have started a small business, just wondering what the future holds and the best way forward. Thank you. Hi Carolyn, I used a quick piece of advice reading for you and drew two runes, Nodes and Manas. So Nodes in this reading clear denotes your way of learning about life and boy oh boy have you chosen the hard way whenever available. Your advice here is that everything will come back around so if you've got to where you are through honesty and integrity you can expect that to keep on coming back to you. Likewise for the more negative things too though and that's really where the problem could lie. I don't know how you are where you are but if it was a good path you're in for good things. As for manas, this is a sign of you learning how to make things happen. I'm guessing you probably had to learn some new skills in order to go into this business venture, right? Well, honey, these runes say that the best things are done through hard work, perseverance and good old elbow grease. Get stuck in, get dirty and get it done. I hope this helps. Last, we're going to read for Dina G, who wrote me, Merry Meet, I was looking to get a rune bag reading regarding whether or not I made the right decision leaving my ex. Thank you, Dina. Hey there Dina, I think first and foremost that it's important you know that the runes might not give you a simple yes or no, they aren't really big fans of that, so be prepared for some mystery in their answer. But also, if you feel that leaving them was right, it was probably right. However, this is not the Agony Aunt Freya segment, it's the rune bag, so let's get rune bagging. I've chosen to read this question using a past, present and future reading, so three runes for you. The rune I drew for your past was Ehwaz. This is the past rune which shows that you were in need of help in the past, but something gave you that help. What's not clear here is where this help came from. Magic, prayer, luck? I'm not sure, but you needed it and it came in spades. Next is your present rune which was Rado and represents reality, which is what you're getting right now. A big old dose of reality and that's often scary and hard to deal with, but there is also good in the bad regardless of how it seems. Keep it in mind as you struggle with harder parts of your decision. This rune in this position also denotes that there's a reason for the things that are happening to you. It's important to keep that in mind sometimes. The third rune, the future rune for you, was Uruz. This rune can be summed up in one word luck. So the future, it seems, is bright. What goes up will come down, the wheel will turn, and by the end of it all you'll be lucky and have something to be thankful for. I think what this rune, what this reading is getting at is, though it seems very difficult now and it was hard and you needed a lot of help to get where you are, luck is on its way and whatever that means for you it's going to be a good thing. So did you do the right thing? Based on this reading I'd say yes and that all the good stuff is on the way for your future whatever that is. I hope these readings have helped each of you with your issues and have put your minds at ease somewhat. If you're listening to this and would like a reading, don't be shy and email me, freyamahogany at jlt.freya at gmail.com with the subject line rune bag and I'll get a reading done for you. This was the rune bag. I'm Freya and until next month, be well.